for centuries. Our kind has stayed hidden, but we've never faced anything like this. This is about the fate of all living things. Let them come. Transformers Rise of the Beasts. Watch the new trailer online now. Well, welcome back. All the smoke, LA pit stop. We get to start today off with a good uh, a guest, someone I've been trying to track down. Thank you, Danielle, because Danielle Legend. is the homie. She's been chasing Nick with me for a couple years. <laughs> oh, uh, said oh, man. Oh, my. Yeah, but we got him here, man. The man of many hats. Uh, welcome to the show, Nick Cannon, man. Beloved. Appreciate, Appreciate you, man. Being here, bro. Pleasure to meet you, dog. It's a pleasure. It's Nick, a pleasure. literally. This is our first time meeting. You probably met oh, me. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it's our first time meeting. So nah. I ain't met you before, bro. When, uh, shoot. <laughs> it's funny that you say that. We met uh, in Chicago uh, at the the 100th, uh, what was that? The, I mean, at. The ministers, uh, um, we at, right, at the at, Criterion. That, we that, sure did. You yeah, sure right? And you forgot that. I forgot that. Yeah. I was so in awe with the, but about the minister. I forgot. You Blame know what I'm saying? You sure right? Yeah, we did. I was me and Al went. Yeah, Al Harrington. You sure right? Blaming on the weed, not his heart. Criterion. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Nick, I mean, rapper, actor, host, comedian, father. Um, tell me what a day in the life of you is like. Man, I mean, like you said, you the first and foremost is. Fatherhood. I'm gonna um, mm -hmm. wake up. Well, crazy thing. I actually wake up. I'm at the office at like 2 a.m. Like I'm on that circadian clock stuff. So I I get up before my day start before everybody. So else. what time you go to bed at? Uh, probably when the sun go down. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just for the, a few hours, cause then uh -huh. I'm up and then you know meditating, working out, doing everything. Usually my my show start around like 6 a.m. Okay. But then like everybody else day, once I knock all that stuff out, then I take the kids to school. Okay. At probably like that, getting them together at like seven, seven thirty ish, drop everybody off by nine, and I'm mm -hmm. back to the office. And every, you know, we doing this type all stuff this, right. all day long based off of what show is in production or you know what artist is in town, and then we move like that. We had a Simba on the show on Wednesday, mm -hmm. uh, young talented artist. He told us he's he's headed on tour with you, and I kind of look at you as like the our generation of kind of Keenan Ivory Wayne's like you oh, have take a, it. <laughs> you have a knack for Absolutely. finding young black talent and giving them the platform to go on and succeed. Uh, talk to me where that kind of mentality came from. Man, too much is given, much is required. Mm -hmm. uh, we blessed so we could be a blessing. A lot of people helped me out on the way up, and you know, it's now to me. I feel like I'm at that point in my life where I just want to build platforms to see other people succeed, mm -hmm. like just help others. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people talk about what we need to do for each other, but you know, who's like, actually doing it? Yeah, Thanks. and it's mm -hmm. just like man, it's just out here just. If I can get it, I know the next kid could get it because they mm -hmm. know all that I know. It, and now I passed it to them, and right. now they got some stuff that they can offer up. Mm -hmm. So that's really what it's all about for me. I mean, I look back, and you know, obviously what you started, and we'll get into all that, but I look like five, ten years from now, and we'll see stars such as DC and some other people, and like, where did he get his start at? And, and, and a lot of those roads are going to lead back to you oh, and I just want yeah. to give you your flowers for that because I think that's really dope man the, the, the opportunity you provide for people who like you said may not have it or may not have just the means of it and you provide that and, and give a lot of people an outlet to you know get their shit together nah that's, I mean that's really what generational wealth is you know what I mean you ain't even got necessarily be something connected directly to your lineage or your DNA but when you can build platforms that people can provide that for their families right. And then, therefore, the offshoot to that, I mean, that's real community right there. Mm -hmm. That's a hell of a comparison you just made. That was yeah. great, dog. I appreciate that's that. Yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've, I've always looked at him that way. Like, yeah, I just love he gives man. people opportunities, man. Yeah. yeah. Good looking. Yeah, I mean, on steroids, though. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. heavy. San Diego. Yeah. Just where you grew up, born and raised in San Diego. The, uh, it's a rumor that your pops was OG on the southwest <laughs> side. A rumor. Southeast side. Yeah. Talk about your bringing. 
Man, yeah, I mean, it's one of them things where every hood around America is the same, you know what I mean? I actually got the opportunity to be raised in, in Southern California and Southeast San Diego, also in North Carolina, moved around, and you know, I've been in the game for a minute, so yeah, grew up in Atlanta, New York, you know, like all, be, all throughout my teenage years, mm -hmm. I was kind of just moving autonomously like that, just as a youngster, so, uh, but nah, Southeast is definitely, what, what raised me and birthed me and it, it was it's interesting because when you hear about san diego you think mini coopers and surfboards for people who ain't never really been yeah, down that's there. where jelani came from so yeah, yeah mini <laughs> coopers and surfboards for sure. <laughs> but it, it's it's quite different it's it's right it's right there next to the border so you can imagine oh, how yeah. much work going back and forth and people really getting to it so mm -hmm. uh but it, it it was all love it was a, a community that's disenfranchised but you know it kind of gave me that upbringing of raised in the church you know projects all of that you know so it, we didn't know we didn't have right because it was it Normal. was still community mm -hmm. you know what i mean and, yeah love yeah yeah so you know my, my parents were teenagers they had me while they was in high school my pops got his life together after he got locked up and, and moved to north carolina that's how uh, we got out there and then, you know, my grandmother was the matriarch of the family and was really raising us all, mm, you know, mm, she got, here. she was a grandmother, you know, before she was 40 type wow. situation. So, um, it is that that's, but it had this unorthodox sense of family that always felt like there was love no matter where, no matter what was going on. Mm -hmm. What you was interested in growing up was a sport. I mean, like you was already. Yeah, automatically I mean, interested we, in music like it was a sports yeah, like thing with, with church man you know anything that that was that was kind of like my my entry point into like audiences and even entertainment because it was like you see that congregation and you see, you know we come from a line of ministers my father's in the men you know he eventually got into the ministry and stuff so i would just peep you know controlling a crowd even though i was like four years old wanting to you know tell everybody to stand when it was time for <laughs> offering and all of that type of stuff um, and then really just seeing all of the instruments around too. My, my mother's father was actually a, a jazz musician and a minister of music. So, and he passed when um, when I was eight and left me all of these instruments. Oh, really? Okay. So yeah, so I got an opportunity to start getting down when I was like eight years old, and then from there it was just I was in love with music, DJing. By the time I got into high school, throwing parties, making mixtapes, that type of stuff. So <laughs> it was just uh, it, the music was in me from the gate. So you're saying you, we all know you started early and you like experienced a lot of things. What what stuck? Like what you what stuck when you knew like you, I made it? Like this is gonna get me there. Like man, because you was doing I everything. Never, yeah, I ain't never really think about it like that because it was always like this is just it's in me. It was a passion just as, as an artist. So I never even thought of it as like a career. You know what I mean? Or even like, but I knew I had I had a hustle about me. So like mm -hmm. you, you know, we did whatever we had to do to make some money. You know, mom. My mom's was uh, married to one of the biggest D boys in the city, so <laughs> we I, I kind of watched how he moved, and that was like, oh, we good, like it was. So I was never thinking about making it out the hood because the hood was feeding us. So right. I didn't have that mentality of wanting to get out. You know what I mean? So even as we got older, and it was just like I just wanted to put on for. It. Mm. So it was. Um, when it started to be, you know, when everybody starts saying I was exceptional in, in certain spaces and winning talent shows and like I would enter a talent show and I would I would come in first and second, like as a stand up <laughs> and as an artist. Yeah. Like yeah. so uh That's dope. so I would just people, it was unique and I and I still I mean like I was just out there hustling. I didn't never think of it as a career. I was just having fun. Mm. So even in high school, like I'd be, you know, at Jamie Foxx's uh comedy festival in Atlanta and like had to be at school on Monday morning, people mm. wouldn't even believe me. I was like, right. so it was just it was just part of my my upbringing. So I never had that mentality like, oh, I made it. I was just like, yo, I'm having a great time. Yeah. Like I'm just having fun. Yeah. So I never want. I never had that destination of like, yo, let's let's get out or let's make it or now I made enough money to where it, mm -hmm. it was never like that for me. Mm -hmm. That's deep. That's deep. Uh, I still be on the in, on the block. I mean, <laughs> I still go like because it's still right. the family is still. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to get down there to San Diego as much as possible, and it's everybody the same. It, it, we still move the same way. How did a lot of people don't know you did stand up? 
Yeah. How did like what did what how did that start? Like you doing stand up? Uh opening up for the preacher man, my pops, you know what I mean? <laughs> like telling Jesus jokes in the church. <laughs> <laughs> like real talk. Like um uh, and because I was young, my pops always would see me doing stuff with the music and stuff, and he'd be like, man, every kid in the projects want to be a rapper. Like, you funny. You can you can control a crowd. You can talk to right. people. And he's like, do that. That's Think outside the box. Be different. And then he would be the type of dude that like would put me on the spot. He had a little a tele... At the time, he had a televangelist show. Uh, you know, one tell of, yeah, yeah. Trying, to, trying, to, <laughs> trying to, you know, sell bless oil and all that type of stuff on public Get your prayer access. Kerchief. Yeah, <laughs> facts. Uh, and I would, you know, it was on cable access. So to be on cable access, you had to go to have a show. You had to go through the workshops and do and learn and learn how to work all this stuff. So he put me through the workshops to be his crew. So I was running the camera, uh, setting up okay. the lights, doing the audio set design at like twelve. You know what I mean? And so, and his reward to me with that would be like, all right, well, now that you went through all of that and worked on my show, you can, you know, have a few hours in the television studio. And I would just be telling jokes, making music, and shit would actually come on TV on, you know, channel 300 or some wild Mm -hmm. shit like that. But it was like, through that, I was like, oh, wow, I'm Mm -hmm. junior high school producing television, telling jokes. And then from there, that's when, you know, it's talent shows and all the stuff I was saying where people just started to take notice. Mm. Uh, you spoke on it earlier, uh, your grandfather passing at the age of eight. Yeah. But, you know, kind of your inspiration behind the music. Talk to us about his impact he left on you. I mean, realistically, it was more just about the, the you know, being eight, you don't really, you know, yeah. but the fact that what he left me. Okay. You know what I mean? And that was always my connection to him to be like, oh, I can get to know him better through all of this mm-hmm. equipment really right. and that's you know to have that level of uh of equipment for an eight-year-old in the hood <laughs> you know what I, mean? right. I had everything right. i had guitars trumpets synthesizers drums like all stuffed into like a closet in a like because we didn't even have you know it was no a project so we didn't yeah. have a lot of space yeah, yeah. yeah but it was just so much so that i would be even for years i would go in there and be like dang i'm wonder how we play this or how to figure this out so that in itself, man, just in teaching myself how to play and then be able to go to church or whatever event and, and get down Try with other out. musicians and stuff. Mm-hmm. I would have never had that if he wouldn't have never left me. So, none of that mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, you break into music uh, officially, Jive Records 2001. What was that experience like for you? Uh, Man, y'all going back. I got to mm-hmm. update my resume. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't even remember, to be honest, because that was so much going on in my life at the time. And I have, like I said, I had been hustling and, you know, I was I was around in the 90s. So mm-hmm. I was, you know, trying to figure out how to, you know, get signed to Death Row, and Bad Boy, all of that. Like, with, like, I remember being, you know, on Sunset Boulevard, the night of the Soul Train Awards, you know, like, and then, like, literally when it was, like, how it look in the movies where like mm-hmm. Snoop and them was on one side of the street Biggie and them was on another Leah was at the house of blues like so growing I felt like I was already in, in the it mix right for since like the mid 90s and mm-hmm. it, I was just that kid that you would always say like what is this kid doing here like mm-hmm. um almost like that the water boy type energy but instead of water I was passing out CDs and mm-hmm. stuff like that so by the time the the deal came around I had already been signed to Will Smith. I have been, you know, did the joint with Jamie Foxx. I had already uh, been on Nickelodeon and all of that stuff. So I actually started Nickelodeon and Jive's record label. And that's what 2001 oh, okay. was. So it was like, it was interesting because like Nickelodeon was this billion dollar company and they was doing all that, but they didn't have a record label. I was like, yo, let's just call it Nick Records. <laughs> and then I was how, and I, you know, kind of had the distribution through Jive. And so even then, I was more of an executive. I wasn't even mm-hmm. trying to be an artist. So it was just like I wanted to produce all of the acts on Nickelodeon and put them out because that was also during the time where Disney was booming right. with Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, you know, in yeah. sync. So I was like, yo, mm-hmm. we should do that over here mm-hmm. and then kind of give it more of an urban spin. So that's how that came about. I think early, mm-hmm. right. That's yeah. what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so early. So- 
Before we get back to this episode of All the Smoke, we have a quick message from DraftKings Sportsbook, today's video sponsor. As the playoffs march on, DraftKings Sportsbook is offering all new customers a can't-miss offer. Calling all new customers. Bet just $5 on any wager, and you will receive $150 in bonus bets instantly. Make sure you take advantage of the offer while you can. There's no better way to feel the action than with DraftKings Sportsbook. DraftKings has so many ways to make watching hoops fun. So what are you waiting for? Download the app. Use our promo code and get into the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use the promo code SMOKE. Bet $5 on any wager and you get $150 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code SMOKE, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Once you clock off work on Friday, head over to DraftKings Sportsbook app and see the All the Smoke Same Game Parlay. We'll be cooking up a new Same Game Parlay every Friday. So ride with All the Smoke, fam. The action only happens at DraftKings Sportsbook. Who were, I mean, obviously the grind was, 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 was in your DNA, but who were some of the people you looked up to in the space? Uh, man, just Puff, Jermaine Dupree. Like, those are the dudes that I wanted to emulate coming up. Like, I just, you know, just being behind the scenes. And, you know, I was signing all the little cute girls in my high school, telling them I'd give them a record deal. <laughs> I don't know what the hell, I did. That, that was my game. You know that's, a, that's, hey, that's a mean hustle, too. <laughs> You can but, tell a girl you can put her on a record or a movie, you yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, I so that's that. like, but even more, that's like, I didn't ever want to be the dude in the front. Like, even I was, you know, trying to, I was producing beats for the homies. I'd be, let me be the DJ. Let me be the dude that could press up the mixtapes and sell them out the trunk mm-hmm. of my mom's car. Like, I, that movement felt like what I aspired to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but once, I, I don't know, man. Like, it, it was just one of those things. I looked up to people like Quincy Jones. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I would do my research on on the OG and the just, greats. So yeah, like even Russell Simmons and people like who were creators of culture, who who had a true impact on our, our lifestyle and what we did. Like mm-hmm. uh, so, those are the people that. And and I mean, even still to this day, when we when we think about the individuals who shaped our culture, it's. It's them, yeah. whether they were producing the music, producing the films. No matter what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. And even, I mean, even, and as I got even older and I started to tap in with cats like Harry Belafonte and Dick Gregory and all, like, even as much of they were showmen, they were producers, they were entrepreneurs, they were, their business acumen was next level, especially when you think about all the adversity that mm-hmm. they were up against in those times. They had to be able to be one person for you on camera, but was really running a full operation right, right. Uh, and putting on not just for the business, but even for the community and the activism space, too. I mean, it seems like you were someone that grew up knowing how to be in front and behind of the camera. So it, it was only right when you uh, started your own label, uh, Incredible yeah. Entertainment. Talk to us about how that started. Yeah, up. it was, man, it, it's one of them scenarios where. I've had several companies, like I said, since high school. I was always trying to do something in, in here and there. And then you can you can have multiple labels and multiple uh, production companies. But at one point, it was like probably mid two thousands, or probably like right. I think right when I got married, I was like, man, I want to just consolidate every business that I have and bring it into one. So because uh, you know, I had television production, I had Mr. Renaissance, I had Can I Ball Entertain, all of this stuff, and it was just. Even as you know, you get to your business manager and you got to sign all of this. And I was like, man, how do we make this just one big conglomerate? And my goal was like, yo, I just want one incredible multimedia, just one-stop shop. And probably that's how it all came together. So probably like around 2009, 2010, I just consolidated everything. And then interestingly enough, that's also 2010 is when I... um, I got in business with Monster, and we created the incredible headphones. And okay. that, you know that when we went on to sell like two hundred million dollars in mm. in headphones in a few years, and you know it was kind of it was on the same pace. I mean, Monster was the same company that uh, created Beats by Dre, so we oh, were kinda, I was the more affordable. Mm-hmm. Uh, we was in Walmart where they was at. You know, all of there's the higher. More, there's end, more so. Walmart people than there are Apple exactly. Store people. Exactly. So. I learned how to build the brand off the heels of that. So it became more than just a company. It became a brand. And that's how we move it. Mm. Love it. 98, you land a role and all that. Yeah. The, talk about the, the uh, process of auditioning and getting that role. Because, you know, I'm starting acting too. So yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I see. I'm, I'm, I see. Yeah. Just salute on that. Appreciate it. 
Uh, it's funny. I didn't. I never auditioned. I ne- It was one of them scenarios. Just what we've been saying. I was behind the scenes. I started at um, my manager and the producers from Nickelodeon saw me doing stand up at the at the Improv on Melrose when I was like fifteen, um, and I was the kid in there. You know, I was I was going. I was Dave Chappelle and. You know, Chris Tucker, everybody go, every month, Monday used to be lit. It, it was Mo' Better Mondays, and all that. it was like, that was the black night, and I was a 15-year-old kid in there doing stand-up, so they was like, yo, this kid got a real voice. Mm-hmm. So, took a couple meetings, and they gave me an opportunity to, you know, do the warm-up, do pretty much my set, you know, before the actual actors and the everybody came out, mm-hmm. and I would have to be put on for like, three hours and it'd be so much like people would be mad when they'd have to go back to shooting like the, the warm-up kid is more <laughs> entertaining yeah. than what's going on uh on the show so from there i was the warm-up and then they start asking me you know for help with the jokes and concepts because i'm still a high school student so they was like well he knows his voice better than than a lot of these adult writers so they allowed me they gave me an opportunity to have uh a staff writer's position at like as a teen, I was the youngest staff writer in, te- yeah, in television history. And then from there, um, I was writing for all that and Keenan and Kel and a bunch of different shows. And like I said, I was started writing my own show. So it was almost by default that mm. I was on the show because I was behind the scenes as the warm up and the writer. Mm. And, you know, even by then, I kind of just was like, yo, I'm going to just have fun. I wasn't trying to, trying to mm-hmm. be the star of the show. Right. Or nothing. I was just there and i think that's even when you think like how snl and a lot of that work like they just find their lane and i was just really as a kid trying to find my lane amongst you know 10 other talented young people it seemed like all this shit was just Destined. fun but i'm saying that they sound fun you know I mean like <laughs> he was having fun about. yeah and then the money started coming with the fun yeah you know what i mean so it don't really feel i mean although it's hours and time it don't really feel like work because you love to do it anyway that's exactly right. that's how i live my life even still to this day mm. it's like I mean, if i ain't having fun i ain't doing it mm. you know and, that, Straight up. and that's a blessing to have that level of freedom Absolutely. to where you can wake up and say i'm gonna do what i want to do mm-hmm. and if i'm not enjoying myself i want to have a delightful disposition so i could fuck with everybody and be cool and like Nobody like to show up to something where they feel like they forced mm-hmm. to be there. So it's like, and and I feel, I think, you know, one of the quotes say is like, money don't make you happy, happy makes you money. Mm-hmm. So that's my first time hearing that. That's a good one. I like <laughs> it. That's my first time hearing yeah. that. How how did you feel when you first landed your first show, the Nick Cannon show? Uh, again, I created it, so it was, you know, I was 18, 19 years old. It was an opportunity. It's funny though too, because I had. I had just had a, a show, I was signed to Will Smith before that through Warner Brothers and they, I had a six episode commitment for a show that I wrote called The Loose, Loose Cannon. I remember I pitched it to Will I was, and I was like, yo, it's like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air but me in the military school. And he was like, oh, I'm rocking with it. And then we put it all together. I'm watching how uh, yeah, Quincy Jones come to the pilot and all that stuff. Six episode commitment. I'm fresh out of high school. I'm like, I'm on, you know what I mean? First thing I do, I get a big check, I buy a Range Rover, you know what I mean? Will's like, man, don't do that. Like, you, you just do. <laughs> He's like, I made that same mistake when mm-hmm. I was your age. I was like, man, whatever. I just got six episode commitment. We was coming on right after the Jamie Foxx show on the WB. Mm-hmm. That was my scheduled slot. Like, And so I'm lit. All of a sudden, they get new people at Warner Brothers, things shift. They go in a whole different direction for that whole block. And my show don't get picked up. That's crazy. So How many episodes was did like, you go through? We got, we just got one, one off. off. Damn. Yeah, I was heartbroken. Like that was probably in the industry one of my first big like heartbreaks because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm on. I just bought a Range Rover. I'm trying mm-hmm. to get my mama a house, all of right. that stuff. And, but so what that did, that instantly humbled me at a, at an early age. So when I was like, bump it, I'm not, I'm. I'm not gonna rely on nobody else. I'm gonna just continue to create my own, and that's when I created the Nick Cannon Show, and took it over, you know, across the street to to Nickelodeon. So, and even though I knew that grind, that like that grind was definitely harder than like coming on after Jamie Foxx. Like right. I thought I was gonna be in that camp, mm-hmm. like when it was Jamie Foxx and the Wayne mm-hmm. Brothers yep. and Steve Harvey Show. Yep. Like it was during that time, and I was like, oh, I'm next up. And I was like, dang, Will was right. I had to 
had to get rid of the Range Rover. I was about to say, you had to get that, that shit back. It took more, <laughs> have moved back in with moms for Ooh. a little bit, like just because. I ran through it and I right. thought it was I it's thought it was about to keep be coming. Popping. Yeah, yeah, it's supposed so, to keep coming. And that yeah. was like tail end, end of the you know, end of the nineties. So I was like by the time I was like, I ain't gonna let that happen to me. How old are you? Shoot, I'm forty two. Okay, yeah, we yeah. the same age. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You, you are not the same age. <laughs> what are you talking about? How old are you? Forty two. Really? I'm three years mean? older than you? <laughs> old ass nigga, what you mean? I'm three years older than you, bro? <laughs> Yeah. I did not know I was three years old than you. Damn, <laughs> old you, ass nigga. He said you were you were not his age. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I thought he was the same age all this time. Nah. No wonder. Uh -uh. Okay, yeah, okay, no. Nah, uh -uh. okay. uh -uh. Yeah, I didn't know uh, that. 2000 I, did, I thought you was an old motherfucker too, bro. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You see all them grades. You don't see no grades over here. Oh, player. I see some now. Okay. <laughs> not as many. No, not as many. Yeah. My shit, salt and pepper. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly salt. But uh, <laughs> uh, 2005, Wildin' Out. I mean, yeah. a, a cult classic. I got a chance to. He needs to, to be on Wild Out. This one of the funniest motherfuckers. He been on, I came on it, bro. No, I didn't see that episode. Yeah, 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 I, I didn't see that episode. Shit. I didn't hey, see that I episode. You need to be yeah. on there. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going out rap some motherfuckers when I get on there. <laughs> yeah. But you, this motherfucker is a comedian, bro. Man, yeah. I know. I didn't really stretch out on that show, though. I was Because I was such Thank a fan. You, I, I would have heard about it. I was just coming to the show to chill. And then and then someone says, like, Nick wants you on the show. I was like, no, I can't. I was blow, too. I'm like, no, I'm just coming. It was during Fashion Week. I was like, no. I'm just coming to watch. And I went and talked to you. Just come on the show. Nick Todd was like, all right, fuck, man. Let's nah, go. So he I needed like, to plead the fifth and everything. You yeah. need to pass some of them insults to other people because I take them every day on the show. <laughs> you got to spread them shits around. <laughs> uh, but uh, Wilding Out, the yeah. thought process and that, how that became, and it's, I mean, it's still doing what it does. Man, yeah, we about, shoot, we, we 20 seasons damn, in already. Damn, we just <laughs> talking about crazy. five seasons in. <laughs> 20. Yeah. Nah, we started back then shit. and it was really... The way it happened, like I, nobody saw the vision. So what I did really was at that time when I was bubbling, kind of doing my thing, and I'd be hanging at the comedy club, or you know, off of Pico, and it'd be all of these other cats there, like looking at me, like, "Hey, put us on, do something," you know what I mean? And I'm like, "I," right. and I was at the time it was cats, you know, Cat Williams, mm. uh, Kevin Hart, D. Ray Davis, like we was all, we all kind of came up. And at the same same time, so we'd just be backstage, literally freestyling, talking shit, talking about each other, mama, like mm -hmm. really just putting that energy right. on. I was like, yo, this is the show right, right here. Right, for real. I was like, uh, so I rented out the comedy club, got some cameras. We promoted it, had everybody come out. Uh, it was like me, Chris Spencer, you know, uh, a couple other people that was kind of structured the, uh, you know, what we was going to do. And turn us just bullshitting into to a, a, a actual show, um, and then you know me and my my dude now Evans kind of put the logo together and the like. I remember creating the logo, mm -hmm. and I was like, "I'm this is gonna be iconic." And then you know took it to MTV, and they're like, "Oh, we get what you're talking about now." I was like, "All right, well, I'm gonna own my brand because mm -hmm. y'all could have paid for it, but I paid for it." So from there, you know, we rest is history. We almost 500 episodes that's crazy later so. now how when it first started uh you were going out and finding talent the word was out they were coming to you how did you start getting talent it was the homies okay. like that's what i'm saying like back then like if you even watched like the first season of wilding out like it was a, a broke kevin hart you know what mm. i mean it was uh i think at the time we had and the first, like the pilot, we had Loon on. Like we had, it was mm -hmm. just like people was like, "Yo, come fuck the homie with us." Yeah, come chill. And then that was the thing too, because at that time MTV had just had like punked. So like Ashton Kutcher was their star. So it was mm -hmm. like you know, and we was like the stepchild to punk. So everybody was going on punk, like Justin Timberlake and Beyonce, and then we was like, "Yo, let's just put Lil Wayne on all." You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it was, it was hip hop. And for when MTV wasn't fucking with it really realistically, we was building the culture. So people was like, nah, I rock with what y'all mm. got going over there. And then just every season, it just started getting bigger, bigger, and bigger. Yeah, okay, so this is the question. This next yeah. question. I want to know, know who has the job. Like, yeah, I want to pop that job to hire wanna, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, similar to what 
Dr. Busted with the Lakers, creating the Laker girls. Yeah. You have created the yeah. Wilding Out yeah. girls. Yeah. And Easy. Easy. I told question. you. <laughs> Everybody relax. Hey, it was like, uh, That's the question. I had a foundation event maybe four years ago with Snoop. And I hit Nick and his team up. I'm like, Nick, we need some women for this pool party. <laughs> Nigga, when I tell you they came through in flying colors, bro. I, who, I can take no credit. <laughs> uh, who has the job to hire the Wild and Out girls? How can I apply? Uh, you want to be a Wild and Out girl? No, <laughs> not at all. Okay. I want to be around them. Okay. <laughs> nah, I mean, honestly, you, you said you gave her a shout out at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, yeah. between the casting mm -hmm. at... Uh, at uh, Paramount and you know VH1 and MTV, but Danielle's been she's super dope. You know CNC <laughs> casting Rosen, they've been doing their thing since season one, mm -hmm. and she really she's a great person. She's great a person, great relationship. She she brings a lot of the talent, you know, on the show, and then at the same time she has her own casting company. And mm -hmm. everything I do, she casts, uh, and she it's it's a delicate thing, especially when you believe like even with like the Me Too era and all of that stuff. We always want to make sure that we're super respectful and we mm -hmm. create an environment for the women. Don't bring to, him around to then. be comfortable. But even in that scenario, you can't. <laughs> I mean, we don't have every rapper on the show right. every, but and it's because of the people. Everybody's pe good people with mm -hmm. good energy. Energy, yeah, and that's say. the thing when you when everybody feels like they're treated well, and it, that's. That's the vibe. So, and I, I attest that all to her. She's just somebody that knows how to bring good people together and make sure everybody head on straight and ain't on that bullshit. Talk to us about a, a, a wild and out shoot day. You guys shoot multiple shows one day. We one shoot show? three episodes in a day. Okay. Yeah. So, and you know, probably because it's it's like it's like a sport. So we we do like you know the the rehearsal or we call it the workout or the workshop, like a week or two before, okay. just putting it on his feet, getting your improv muscles together. So, because none of it's written, we just right. going off, off the, top, the top, but you got to yeah. know how to play the game. You got to keep the speed, keep the rhythm, keep the flow going. And so then by the time we get to shooting the show, and Second it's whatever major. happens, mm -hmm. I mean, you get to you get to see it. You mm -hmm. know, it's um, you get to see it happening in real time. If somebody say something that ain't funny, we're going to make funny mm -hmm. for not being funny. Okay, they're going to let you know. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, somebody stumble, we're going to laugh. You know, if some, but it, and you just see everybody's skill set and talent, and it just go, you know, it, it, what you see on TV is how long it really took us to shoot it. I mean, it'd be a little stop down here and there, but our goal is to make it feel like it's live so we can knock three out and mm -hmm. we done. I mean, obviously, you've had a lot of success in the entertainment space, but did. did, did Wilding Out surprise you on just its longevity and the ability to be a platform for so many different people to branch off and do their thing? I mean, it, it did. It I didn't see it as where it is now. You know what I mean? I knew it was going to be successful. I knew it was going to be special. I knew the, the logo was going to be iconic mm -hmm. and all of that. But I didn't see, like, man, we just sold out Madison Square Garden. We sold out the Staples Center a few times. You know, we on tour every summer. Mm -hmm. And people come out for it. Yep. We got board games. We got restaurants. You know what I mean? I opened up one in Miami, uh, San Diego. We opening one in L.A. now. It's just like, I, I didn't know that that IP was going, you know, diversify in so many different places. Mm -hmm. So. And the fact that it could continue to go on and on, mm -hmm. and even in the digital space now, it's it's really strong and giving others opportunities. I mean, that's what I always set out to do initially right. was to give my friends jobs. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, I'm it's funny. I'm hiring some of their kids and putting them on the show mm -hmm. at this point. Oh, so yeah. to to have it uh, across multiple generations and still going, and if people, a lot of people feel like it's still new. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's crazy to see like. You know, I got a, a eleven year old son, and him and his friends I was about talking saying, about my twins. What they fourteen? So yeah, like it's just like that next level. It's yeah, just like the next generation. It. Yeah. So and that's the that's the vibe to where mm -hmm. it's like, yo, I'm now like, all right, well, how long can this joint rock for? Like, Let it run. I remember it was like, yeah, I'm gonna do a hundred episodes and I'm done. Five. Then I was like, nah, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and try to get to ten seasons. All right, let's go twelve. You know, like now, you know, like I said, we we surpassed twenty and so syndicated, right? Yeah, once, once you get to that level, yeah, it's yeah, life. Like, like so. Yeah, that show gonna be on forever. I love it. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, five hundred plus shows, memorable shows, memorable people on it. Like anything come to mind when I ask that? Um, favorite show, maybe. 
I mean, like I said, but your episode was fire. I don't know what you talk about. You got you know, active. Just, <laughs> it was active. It's one of the classics. Yeah, when you go active. online and you see the real like classic moments, you got some classic because you was up there talking that shit. Man. We didn't expect <laughs> you to say some certain things. Um, but Snoop, you know, Snoop been there a few times. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Probably it's Snoop, and he one of the people that he don't care. He'll get up there and joke with you, but he'll also freestyle. Get on you, know. yeah. So Snoop is probably the most. He'll he, most he ha ha until you say some shit. He go get on your ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, facts. Yeah, uh, you got an opportunity to work with Jordan to create a sneaker. Uh, how did that uh, partnership come together? Man, that's interesting because it's funny. the The joint that I worked on was. A, a Jordan 7 and it was like all of the years I think we were doing it was almost like a, a commemorative all the years of wilding out so I had like the red had the gold the platinum like it, it was dope and I had a few pair and they was like they're gonna make mad limited joints for the cast members and we was gonna give it to the guests that season and I like I don't know what happened like I, this was like pre-pandemic and then I started seeing online where somebody had designed some fours and it was calling them the Wild Now fours. I was like, they will make the ones that I designed. So like, I could, you know, that sneaker culture is so, mm. you, you, it's real. Like mm -hmm. you gotta really be about it. So uh, I'm still waiting for the Wild Now sevens <laughs> to come out. <laughs> but it was, a, I mean, it's a, you know, it was cats who grew up loving sneakers and specifically. Can you call were, Mike? We're Jays. He got Mike's number. <clears throat> can you call Mike and ask what's up with the uh, Incredible Sevens? I, <laughs> I, I sure can act like it. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but that, you know, that that's a, that's a world where I was just excited to right. even be able to create. But the ones that everybody oh, talking about now, I ain't had nothing to do with those. <sighs> I pick up my phone and look who texts me. Look at the second message. He sent me one too. I see. Okay. Oh, oh, Steve from yeah, Jordan. That's Jordan. That's Jordan's <laughs> that's guy. Yeah, he's yeah. that energy. Drumline. Yeah, man. Ooh, that was How dope. was that? Let's talk about that. Yeah, that was shoot, twenty years ago, man. It was at the AU Center, Atlanta. You know, uh, a lot of people don't know uh, that Drumline is Dallas Austin story. Both. Mm -hmm. No question. I knew a that. ATL and Drumline mm -hmm. are both his Dallas stories. Austin. Yep. And he was a producer on both of them. I remember we did, we did, um, we did Drumline first, and he was like, "I got this other movie called Jelly Beans," and he was telling me it was about this roller skating rink in in Atlanta that uh, him and T Balls from TLC and all. So he's like, "We used to go," and that's eventually what became ATL. Uh, ATL. Mm -hmm. But he was just a creative man on them subcultures, and obviously, I mean, he's a, one of the best producers of that generation. Uh, so he he uh, was a, a musician, but never knew how to read music, but was just dope on the snare, and then that's how you know we got that story. And you know, me growing up, almost in a similar story, teaching yourself, self-taught musician, I kind of picked up on that vibe, and you know, you go in, and that it was. It's only so many like mainstream big budget projects uh, right. for our culture that come ever so often. So everybody and their mama was auditioning for it and knew about it. And so I had the the relationship. And I remember even I had to have uh, I, had, I had a big homie call the the president of Fox. Uh, I had to have Will call mm. uh, to be like, "Yo, this is the kid you want." Cheat code. <laughs> it's Cheat funny code. you said that because we had Ti on uh, when we was in Atlanta like a month ago, and he said he was auditioning for the role too. But that's the thing. That's kind of funny how you know even you know I I was supposed to do you know the, the other one. the ATL the as well. Bean, so uh -huh. that and you always that's funny because I'll be watching the different shows and stuff and everybody was like, Yeah, I was supposed to be this person. Mm -hmm. It's like of course that's what your team gonna tell you that they want you <laughs> they, they, right, they right. want you to come in and read for it. Right, right. <laughs> but at, at that point and then you know because everybody's doing their thing, whether you are artist or athlete or already established, but they're looking for that's the that's the magic about acting and about this art form that when you know it's right, it's going to be right. Mm. You know, and that's a, the eye of a casting director, the eye of a director. So it don't even be no love loss. It don't be like you less talented than this person or anything. It's just like for what this story is. What we're looking for. We Yeah, you can be the vessel to get that there. And, you know, I, I just gave it my all at a young age, but I ain't had no hopes in it. I didn't know what it was going to be. Again, I just thought it was another dope opportunity mm -hmm. to have fun. And, you know, I was going to go hard because I knew this world. And then once we went to Atlanta, it's another thing, too. They want, I remember for, you know, uh, 
Orlando Jones, originally they they wanted Jamie Foxx for it. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, originally. Like, Orlando he, killed it, though. Yeah, but that's what I was like. It, I can't even mm -hmm. see it. It's Jamie's my favorite actor, mm -hmm. and, and but I don't think he could have been Dr. Lee. And it's right. funny because mm. Drumline became one of Jamie's favorite movies. And then, really? like, he was so proud of me. He's like, you knew me since I was a kid. And he's like, he would... For years, come up to me reciting lines of like, man, I love that movie. You and Orlando killed it. So it's like the energy is right. just when it's right, it's, it's right. right. That's what I'm right. saying. When it's right, it's right. Yeah. Yeah. Can you read music now? Yeah. 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 That was a, I was in the choir and I played in the band in middle school, but that was the hardest thing to do. Bro. Yeah. Like it's one of the. I mean, you know how I go. Once it's tedious. Mm -hmm. So as kids, you don't want to do it. But even now, like sight reading, like if I sit down, I gotta. It's gonna take me a minute. But if I just want to mess around I can go crazy and that's the same thing on the drums or anything but when you got to keep that tempo and you know it, it's the language to keep you know the frequency moving so mm -hmm. as you're reading you got to make sure you vibe into so it's it's not the easiest thing in the mm -hmm. world but it's mm -hmm. also it's it's simple yet complex mm -hmm. what's the difference between TV and the big screen Nowadays, nothing. Right. Uh, I mean, it's all on multiple screens now. Back then, it used to be there were it was some compartmentalization based off of movie stars were looked at. Yeah, they used to say television stars are more like family because they're in your home. Movie stars are more in awe because they're forty feet high, mm -hmm. and then music stars are more connected to your heart and your passion because they're in your ear and mm -hmm. they're part. They they're the rhythm and the pulse and the soundtrack to your life. So that's why. I, being able to be a part of all Just three about to of them. say you fuck with all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's really finding a connection because ain't nothing like feeling like you know when you're on TV, everybody, mama, boy, y'all, I know you, you was mm -hmm. like they, they is mm -hmm. that energy because they see you on TV every day in their house and they ain't have to pay for you right. to be there. But you know, movie stars, people are a little little starstruck because they see you on that big screen and then music people got so much pat. That's why we fall in love with the. The Tupacs and the Waynes and the, you know, Boosies and the mm -hmm. Mary J's and Beyonce's because we feel like, yo, I couldn't, I wouldn't have made it through without this, without this song mm -hmm. or that. So it's like, I've always saw, you know, the, the, the different nature of being able to tap into each one of those and you know be blessed enough to operate in all of those. Mm. Is it a movie that we know of and seen that you've turned down? Man, we we be here all day. <laughs> Turn down or also like you know just. He said we'll be all day. Man, it, this this game is crazy, but it, it's you get to that point, and it's even even after you pass the audition stuff. I've had movies that uh, I've developed that were mine, and because uh, a bigger actor or a bigger director would come in and be like, yeah, now nah, I want to do that, and then the studio would be like, well, we're gonna make a hundred million dollars if he does it. And it's like, damn, like it was, I remember one story, man, this was another one that broke my heart because I, it was, um, I remember I was at the premiere of The Matrix uh, and it was, like, it, was, it might have been The Matrix 2 and the, uh, there was this producer who produced all the Fast and Furious movies, Neil Moritz, and we was like, super cool, man. He was like, I got this great film for you called RPM. He's like, it's about a... Uh, a black Formula One driver, a young Formula One driver, and uh, he goes overseas for this big jewelry heist, and he's stealing jewelry on the side while he's win mm. winning Formula One races, and his partner in crime is this big jewel thief. And it's like, we're going to get Nicolas Cage to play it. It's going to be you and Nicolas mm. Cage, Nick and Nick. It's like, it's going to be just as big as Fast and the Furious. And I'm juiced. Like, I got <laughs> it's the dude who made Fast and the Furious. Mm -hmm. Like, and he be putting me with Nicolas Cage and we rocking and I get all we do the deal. I'm like, I'm on now. Like I feel feel like I was like, oh, this is the one. This is like, there's like this is gonna be bigger than Rush Hour and all this mm. Nick and Nick and all of this stuff. I'm like, was, and then they they're like, we're just trying to close up uh Nicolas Cage deal because, you know, uh we offered him 20 million, but uh oh, he wants 25. And they're like, we're gonna see if we can get there. And then he uh some some other producer gave him twenty five to do this movie called National Treasure. Mm, <laughs> and wow, he went there yeah. and did National. Damn. I was like, but Nick, come on, man. Yeah. What, what about me? me? Yeah. What about me? <laughs> <laughs> Damn. But, like, but it's stuff like that happens 
all the time. Mm, yeah. And and that's even one of those times was like, I got to stop getting excited mm-hmm. about stuff until, you know, you can speak it into existence and watch it coming to fruition, but don't, you know, don't don't start trying to scramble them eggs so till it's it almost, happens. So yeah. it's, it's almost till it comes out, because sometimes you can shoot shit that never goes either, man, right? Man, there's so much, that's happened several times where we done made movies mm. and we thought it was going to go and then sit on the shelf five years. Damn. And then by the time it come out, like it lost culture juice. Done shifted yeah. or, you it's a good know what new I mean? world. Like, yeah. So it's you never know. You just gotta be in it for the moment and appreciate the the present and the gift in that at that time. Mm. Is there anybody that you are in all working with? You work with Samuel Jackson, Angela Bassett, yeah. Steve Harvey. Uh shoot. Man, I, I mean really working with Spike just as a filmmaker mm-hmm. and watching how Spike moving that was I, I love just who he is for the culture, who he is as a person. Spike is really that dude, man. Like so I'm trying to think anybody like that. That's the probably person I was a student of, and I was just following him around and watching how he, he, he was getting to it and even how he was dealing with people like Wesley Snipes and, you know, telling him where his motivation was and how to, how to portray the character and talking to Angela Bassett and... You know, like you said, Samuel Jackson. So I'm just over his shoulder, just peeping how the reverence that they have for him. Mm-hmm. And, and so Spike is probably the the person That's I was dope. probably in the most the in the in awe of. How was it making Inkwell? Inkwell, I wasn't in Inkwell. I mean, I, not Inkwell. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me, not Inkwell. It's not funny Inkwell. that you say that. Not I know, you, but the not love Inkwell. don't cost a thing, Joy. Uh, I'm talking. Uh, love don't cost a thing. What the fuck I said, Inkwell? Yeah, because love. they damn near the same, same movie. movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> love don't like, cost a thing. You the one. You like one of the few people who pick up on that because it's funny too. Because think about it, where. We first saw because it's a lady in this movie that I like. Uh, yeah. You see Lorenz Tate as old dog and menace, where he mm-hmm. he's a straight gangster, and then the next time we see him, he in the inkwell yeah. as a straight nerd. That's the same type of movie yeah. too. Yeah, it's exact and it's same funny. Movie. The same thing with me is like in in Drumline, I was a little thug, and then the next movie you saw me in was Love Don't Cost a yeah. Thing. The same. Nerd with the little twist mm-hmm. and trying to figure out, trying to get the hot girl. Like, so I know she I'm, was hot. Yeah, but that like, shoot, that girl. Um, of who was the girl? Ink? Well, it was Jada, wasn't it? Come on, man, how you not remember that? Yeah, that was Jada. Come Ingle, on, bro. And obviously, I my love interest in love of course the thing was Christina Milian. So, so you know, it was it, it, it was a time. Come on, man, it was, it was a the time. time. Christina Milian is the softest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid, the Are you kidding me? Me and my wife love Christina Milian. <laughs> we talk about her. It's Come stupid. on, man. She's just soft. Uh, you had the courage to share with the world. How you not know that? Um, How you not know that? Uh, <laughs> your illness. Yeah. Lupus. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's, you know, normally when people go through stuff, it's, it's always a private, and you felt, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know what you want, what you felt, but explain why you felt to share it with the world. It was, it was an interesting time. It was like 2012. I was married. I just had, you know, two kids. And to get hit with something that I didn't understand, you know, you get, you start thinking about, like, is this hereditary? Is this, am I going to die now, later, soon? What do I, like, how do I got to figure this out? And I was like, man, if anything, if I know I'm struggling with this, there's a lot of people out mm-hmm. here who are probably struggling with, you know, chronic illness and, and uh different situations that don't have the the information that is being given to me or even the the process so i was like yo i want to i want to be able to to be a conduit for anybody who's dealing with any form of illness to be able to say you don't have to be ashamed of it Mm -hmm. uh and it was a learning process because it you know i i was able to tap into a lot of communities because not because uh my lupus diagnosis was also a you know, affecting my kidneys too. So there's a the whole kidney disease community. And uh, so people just embraced me where it, it was a little nerve wracking at first because I was dealing with stuff. And, you know, you get out there and you, lupus is a, a condition where people, you could look like you are all right, but you can be going through it. Like you take hours to get out of the bed type of stuff, or you just, you know, inflammation, wherever it lands in your body can affect so many different things that you never even would be thinking about it. You know, the medicines can make your hair fall out, make you my, swell up, and 
all of that stuff. And so I got to still be an entertainer right. <laughs> while dealing with this. So it was a little easier for people kind of certain times they were understanding like, ah, he, he not, a, he not on his A game right now. Give him a minute. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and that's at least from my, my personal condition, I've learned like, even when I do have flare ups or little setbacks, it's always a get back. So it just, you got to just treat your body right. You got to listen to your body. And it's actually made me more health conscious and probably more aware of what's going on and focused on health and wellness than I would have ever been before. Mm. Because a lot of people go to the gym and work out because they want to look good. I I do it because I want to stay alive. Mm. So it's like, I've studied every type of diet and really you got to figure out what works for you in a scenario like that. Everybody's different. The balance of what prescribed medicines, you know, or holistic approaches. I've done it all. I've mm-hmm. sat with every type of doctor to kind of get to that space to be the, you know, the the best vessel I could be. I want to, uh, yeah, I want to commend you because my third oldest daughter is dealing with lupus and some it just shuts her down sometimes. So to see you still be able to do everything you're doing, man, I commend yeah. you, bro. Because I, 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 I know how tough it could be, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nah, I appreciate. It. And people don't see that, but that's to me when you have a, you know, a condition like that. You, what I've learned is like staying active and consistently, then that that prevents getting there. And that's you know I was in the hospital in December because I was going so hard, wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. And then once once it hits you, it take you all the way out. Mm-hmm. So and and that's the thing. You're like, I right, I'm gonna do right next time. Like you mm-hmm. literally like right, I'm not gonna let that happen again. Mm-hmm. So I uh, I think hopefully you know whether they find a cure or even a process but hopefully you know i'll be able to ride it out as long you know, as long as i'm supposed to I, my mm-hmm. doctors always tell me like if you take care of yourself you could live a normal life but you start you have bullshitting yeah. and you know it's gonna take you out for those that and and and, and forgive me because i'm not very uh educated on the process can you tell me what, like what a tough day is like yeah man i mean honestly it's it's inflammation. I mean, we've all okay. kind of yeah. dealt with that, and like, and it, and it's you know, at least mine specifically is kind of related to like the the effects of what probably what arthritis is, okay. or you know what I mean, where your joints lock up. Literally, you can't move your hands, can't, and then you start to swell up, and you get this stuff called edema, where it's like it's water, your body's inflaming all over. So um, you can't get out of bed, you can't move, and mm. then and it just feels like bad cramps Mm -hmm. and then it takes a minute like to me sometimes it used to be like i just have to however i can make it to the shower or to the bath and then hot water actually like all right and then from there it's like making sure i put the right vitamins and vegetables and stuff like that because getting your system to recognize how to get rid of inflammation we all got remedies and stuff how to Mm -hmm. get rid of inflammation so it's a lot of that type of stuff and even simple ideas like green or ginger tea like that type of stuff helps but then and it's usually it's a morning time and a nighttime thing once i'm in the day and i'm moving i'm active Mm -hmm. i can do it's cool but then by the time the sun go down again Mm. that's when it's like cramping up and can't move and and then that puts a toll on your mind and you know and i'm pretty sure like shoot if it's inflamed everywhere else it's probably inflamed here too so Mm. um but i think that's even not like I found different methods to help deal. Like that's why I was even saying the circadian clock thing is something that, you know, Dick Gregory even told me about, you know, back then he was like, yo, our bodies tell you, you're supposed to go to sleep when the sun goes down. That's just human nature. He was like, that was, that was a defense mechanism for with predators, you know, back in the ancestors days because, and that's when your body really needs to recharge. If you, if you eating and staying up during the times where your body's supposed to be, recuperating you gonna throw throw the clock off and he's like and then if you get up before the sun or with the sun now your body gets a true chance to feel all of those enzymes and things and refresh its way properly so now just even with with that shift in practice i don't have to deal with a lot of those pains and stuff because i go to sleep you know when my body tells me to and then i wake up and i have that time whether it's from yoga or meditation to make sure i'm all stretched out, not cramped up, and I ain't got to worry about none of the arthritis. Mm. Stuff. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. <clears throat> we both, me and Matt, both the fathers. I think Matt is uh, one of the guys who can be a mascot for being able to juggle a million things and be a father. And you also yeah. are a, a father and, and have a, a man that wear many hats. How is it 
juggling work and fatherhood. Man, I love it, man. That's my first job. Like you when we talk about what it's just that there's no joy like fatherhood, mm -hmm. man. Like when you Thanks. really tap into it. I mean, we even chasing the bag, chasing all everything we could chase out here, but when you really see the the effect that you can have over your children from birth to whatever they become like even like um in awe of you, man, coaching and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Like, shoot, my son got a game today that mm -hmm. I got, you know what I mean? And like, I never, it's interesting because I didn't necessarily have that energy for my pops, you know, but he, he was present and, you know, taught me about spirituality and religion and all of that. But to, I never thought I'd be like the coach dad or, right. you know, or the, uh, cause sports wasn't my, my thing necessarily, but to see, you know, all of the, the the values and and how it's just even just making making my kids like better people right just in understanding discipline there's and so many things you could take from yeah. sports to and you don't even have life. to implement it no. you know what I mean like once and you and you just follow their passion mm -hmm. and it's like so man just just that alone I'll be more interested in that than anything that has yeah. to do with work or career because I'm mm -hmm. like one because you know a psychology degree I'm like I'm watching their brains develop. On and passion off of what they want and the the, mm -hmm. the people that they're becoming, and I'm just trying to support that. So I'm fascinated to to understand what like a five year old can digest in terms of or an eleven year old or how they putting this together because they way more brilliant than we oh, ever yeah. were. And mm -hmm. just like whether it's the access to the technology and mm -hmm. stuff, but it's it's so fascinating, man. That I learn stuff from my children every day of from all the ages. I'm just like. Wow, I would, you know, because I'm deep into it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, one of one of my kids, uh, he's six years old in the second grade, reading at uh, eighth grade level. Oh, but it's like we 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 developed, and I that's credit to his mom. Mm -hmm. Like, I, but like I and you know she she getting her PhD in psychology right now. So we really study the brain and how the neurotransmitters click and fire off at certain age, sensory ages and developmental processes of when when kids start to recognize language and so it's that type of stuff to where I'm on that so heavy that every day I'm learning something about and then you know even when you think about like the like Freud's process of how we deal with therapy they always take us back to our childhood mm -hmm. so as I'm examining my own shit and trying to be be a better person through therapy I'm watching Memories that I had when I was five and six that might have shaped who I am now, and I, mm, I got a five sure. or six year old, yeah, so I'm like, sure oh, let me make sure I don't mm -hmm. do that, or yep. let me, or if I did make this mistake, how do I correct it now yep. so he don't make the same mistakes mm -hmm. as I did, or she doesn't get put Absolutely. in a position. So, so it's crazy, man. Like fatherhood is has a, shown me so much growth, and really, I've, it's become my life passion. What's the thought process behind the names with your kids? Cause that I'm, that's part of it. That's like, part you know what of I mean? it. Like, yeah, there's so much in the name, and it's so much and, and speaking things into existence. It's the power of of words, man. It's 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 funny that it's that's why they call it spelling, because it's like we cast spells with our words. You know what I'm saying? And and it's I always wanted there to be a meaning and. You know, even like some of that come from a culture we have like African names and we we hear them, but we don't necessarily know what they mean. Yeah, I wish I could have chose my name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What would it have been? It would have been a Muslim name. Yeah. Okay. But and but even again, because there's there's culture to it. There there's things that at least you know it'd be like the God within, or like when you get to it, or mm -hmm. you know. Uh, warrior chose, and I was like, I, I I might go in that direction, but I want everybody to know what the mm -hmm. word is. So instead of, you know, naming one of my daughters, you know, a, a word that means beautiful. No, I want to name her beautiful. Right. <laughs> so when you step in, everybody got to call her that. Instead mm -hmm. of knowing that my one of my daughters is a powerful queen, I could have did that in Swahili or Spanish or anything. It was like, nah, we just going to call her powerful queen. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so like, everybody can you stepped give in us, and can got you, to do that. Can you give us the list of names? And, and yeah. Let's, let's it's like everybody be trying to do that. It's a game show challenge. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want I just want it because I got I got every... I got seven in the bonus yeah. daughter, and I'll be getting stuck sometimes. Yeah, I was about to say between y'all two, y'all can have like three NBA teams. So <laughs> <laughs> we gonna start a league. Yeah. Nah, but uh, my oldest is uh, Moroccan and Monroe. Rock and mm -hmm. roll as uh, 
That, I, I can't even take full credit for those names. That's that's Mariah. I mm. gave him the nickname, but Mariah always loved uh, Marilyn Monroe. And then we, you know, the Moorish concept with me, like that. Mm -hmm. the, I always had a love for Morocco, and the, we had a Moroccan room in, in the house. So that's where I proposed to her. So mm -hmm. he's like, yo. So that's where Rock's name came from. So and then I had Golden, uh, and that's the one I was talking about was literally a genius. Yeah, so it was mm -hmm. like, we, the, the name worked. It worked. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so there's Golden and Powerful and Rise. And then uh, I have Zion, Zillion, uh, Beautiful Zeppelin. She would, we added Beautiful at the end because, but she, she had all Z names and then we had Zen and then uh, we got Legendary, Legendary Love. And then I got Onyx and then my youngest is Halo. Mm. There you go. That's dope. Yeah. More? I don't know, man. I I, I ain't planning on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tapped out, but you know, <laughs> like, like you you never know, man. I I I believe you know my my twelve is right where it need to be. Mm. It's the it's that's the, heavy. That's my jury. That's the mm. constellation. The mm. disciples. We rock it. Mm. It's the dirty mm. dozen. <laughs> I um. Uh, I, a parent is never supposed to bury their child. Yeah. My mom, uh, I just buried my little brother, and my mom has not been the same person since. Yeah. And um, you went through that. You've been through that, losing a child. Yeah. So can you talk about that? Yeah, man. It, it's it's Nobody should have to experience that. I mean, we all lose people, you know, in the physical, and it actually makes you tap into your spiritual a little bit more and understand that beyond this dimension, there's so much more. And you, you really feel like as, if, if I've lost somebody physically, it as painful as it is, if you have a spiritual connection, you know how to get yes. back to them and be in tune mm -hmm. with them. And you said to be absent from the body is to be present with the most high. And if right. we're on that highest frequency, you know how to tap They're into it. always there. Yeah. And, and it sounds a little esoteric, and, and but it's real. You know what I mean? And only people who have lost somebody know what that it. is. And yeah. even losing a child, man, it's like because you feel the guilt of not being able to get all that you felt like you was gonna get naturally. You, mm -hmm. you take that for granted. You never think your your child gonna leave. Mm -hmm. So even you you don't have as many memories as you want. You know, uh, or even man, I wonder if he understood or if there was a connection. And then then that then it's that space of all right. Well, if we tapping into energy, you know what I mean? Is that energy living? gonna live on is it gonna be reciprocated so those are the things that keep you up at night you know <laughs> but having family and having the people to go through it with you mm -hmm. is what keeps you strong man mm -hmm. that's and, a boy and, system yeah and, and that's and really keeping you know keeping the the physical memory alive uh you never want to run from it people grieve differently mm -hmm. uh but you gotta you gotta do it you know what i mean you know you like you, you can't heal if you can't feel. Mm. So like it's you gotta feel that so you can allow yourself to heal a little bit. Mm. I um I just I want to tell Matt this because I ain't never told this story. As soon as you hear, I don't mind sharing it. Um, it was like three days after my brother's funeral, and um, I was laying in bed with my wife, and, and you know my wife snore a little bit, right? So I'm 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 up a little bit, but I'm sleep. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm thinking about my brother, so I'm mm -hmm. up crying. Mm -hmm. So as I'm dozing off, she's snoring. And I'm getting into a deep sleep, and her third snore comes out, and it says, Jack, in my brother's voice. Mm, wow. Through her snore. Wow. And I jumped up, and two seconds later, my mama walked in the room and said, did you hear that? Wow. Bro, it was the craziest shit ever. Mm. Wow. The craziest shit ever. So they with you, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They with you. He, 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 I believe. I, but I'm a living testament of that. <laughs> wow. That's my first time I ever experienced something like that. That's yeah. crazy. That's crazy. Nah, like I said, man, these different dimensions and different realms that we we our spirits go to, it's it's real. Mm. Who, we can't explain it. Can't explain it. But we're not supposed to be able to explain it. Jamie Foxx, a favorite of ours, yeah. uh, someone you've known for the a long time. The funniest episode we probably had was Jamie <laughs> Foxx. I know, he, I know he came in and turned up. Hey, before the cameras even came on, we was dying laughing. Yeah. Uh, it, it, explain what he's uh, meant to you and, 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 and any funny stories you could share with us. Man, he just, I've never witnessed somebody like that, man. Like, really, so talented, the most talented person I've ever seen in my life, but so kind and really, like, the life of every room he walks into, man, and just like 
energy always on how I keep good people around him. He a good dude. Like I've I'm never witnessed it. And again, being a young man to be able to watch cats like him and Will Smith and all of these dudes maneuver and create their own dynasties and still just be cool. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like and, and it's it's crazy when you think of the heights that that Jamie has reached. Mm-hmm. Uh He's he's the best to ever do it, but the humblest dude in the world. So cool. Uh, I, Jamie's one of the best people ever. I remember when I was uh, I posted that thing about George Floyd crying the next morning. I said I was on my way to Minnesota. I'm talking about as soon as I landed, Jamie Foxx called me. I'm on my way. I've never met him. Yeah. I'm on my way to stand right by your side, bro. He came mm. down and stood by my side doing a press conference and all that. I yeah. can't I can't say how much I love Jamie yeah, Foxx, yeah. dog. Yeah, nah, he's a, he a real one. Mm. Is there anyone in 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 kind of your space right now that you feel like could be the next one? Uh yeah, man. I mean, that's what this Future Superstar Tour is about. Like, really, these young kids, man. Is I can't even. It's it's a bunch of. Them. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it's a bunch of them, man. Even from even the spaces like the kids with the on, on Wild and Out too. Like mm-hmm. even like we talk about DC, he, like yeah. he super talented. Mm-hmm. Got that superstar energy, um, but it's it's so many young people. I couldn't even pinpoint. But that's I mean, come rock with us on this yeah, tour. You are gonna see gonna them all. You know what I mean? From from Simba on down to this kid J D. McQuarrie, he's a singer, actor, dancer kid. He was the voice of Simba and uh, oh, Lion yeah. King. Yeah, yeah, I heard yeah, about like, him. Uh, that's what that's that's the gift that God has given me, man. To be able to be a conduit and a curator for. Mm-hmm. For new talent, so are you guys in LA all for this tour? Uh, yeah, shoot, we're in LA this weekend. We uh, LA and Anaheim. That's where we kick it off, and we go. Then we got Texas next week, Atlanta, Miami, mm. Chicago, all the way to we New York. I'm gonna say I'm about to pull up on you this weekend, and yeah, I ain't got yeah, nothing yeah. to do neither. Yeah, yeah. Um, your career really almost seems like you started when you was a kid. Yeah, but looking back on it now, and obviously we know you still have a long way to go. Do you ever just kind of sit back and, and, and appreciate what you've accomplished, the doors you've opened for not only yourself but others, or is it too much of I'm still got more to do? I just I still got more to do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I feel like it's just the beginning. I feel like I'm definitely stepping to that space where the, the main goal is just to help people. Mm. It's just to do for others. I've I've done everything I could ever imagine, man. Like stuff that I wasn't even part of my dream has come come true for me. So Again, it goes back to that too much is given, much is required, mm-hmm. you know, and practicing compassion. That's at, at at the highest level, at the highest frequency, like wherever I can show people that like, yo, we chilling, we good, we mm-hmm. you good. I'm mm-hmm. I'm here to do for you. Like I'm I'm a servant of the people. Mm-hmm. I was blessed to be able to meet Nip, spend some time with yeah. Nip. Um you taking that Dr. Sebi uh documentary. Yeah. Is where where is that out? Is it coming? Is we it still going? in post, yeah, man. Okay. It's just, I mean, it's because the pandemic kind of messed a lot of stuff up, mm-hmm. you know, because we was we was ready to rock, and then we actually even had to add a lot of that type of stuff in there. So it's it's now it's just about getting it right, and for everybody involved, for for Nip's legacy and family, for Doctor Sebi's legacy and family. Telling and being authentic and telling the true story and really getting to it. But I know the culture wants it mm-hmm. so bad. You know, that's probably one of the main questions that I get asked more than anything is like, yo, when the Dr. Sebi doc dropping in? We just want to make sure, it's right. one, it's at the right platform because even what I, you know, I promise, you know, Nipsey's family is that we're going to handle it with prestige. Mm-hmm. We're going to make sure that it, whatever we do, it got to be. You know, award winning and, and world renowned. It can't just be something that you, oh, yeah, I saw that on YouTube. You know, like it got, and even to for Dr. Sebi's family too, because, you know, his holistic teachings have helped so many and, and really can be eye opening whether you practice it or understand it or don't. It's still about, you know, uh, uh, a black man who was standing firm against the system mm-hmm. uh, and internationally was trying to, you know, educate people about the African bio mineral process. And that's that's a real thing. And, you know, just even what we were talking about, you, the body is a self-healing organism. And if you can tap into that and understand that, you know, big pharma don't get a chance to, mm, to a chance be a to pro- process mm-hmm. to be a, uh, a part of your healing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Beautiful thing. Wish you the best of luck nah, on that. We, it's coming, though. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> now we got quick hitters, man. First thing to come to mind, let us know. Uh, favorite country or city in the world to visit? Ooh. 
Dang. Jamaica. Oh, I ain't been to Jamaica yet. I what? need to get there. What? I've been to a lot of different places. I've been like to Like the Santa Ana. What? <laughs> what? Nah, you got to go here. Jamaica. You got to go to Sandals in Montego Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Sandals. That's Tell me, bro. Say it. They got the uh, apartments in the water. <laughs> Whatever they call them shits. I don't know what they call them. It's a name. What they call the little houses in the water? Cabanas? Nah, it's not, nah that's not a cabana. Don't call them cabanas. Cabanas about the things on the side by the pool. The, the villas. villas. <laughs> bungalow, bungalow, bungalow. That's what they call bungalows in the middle of the water, fool. And you can look through the uh, thing and see. You can the, look through. Yeah. The, you can look through the floor and see the fish swimming and all mm -hmm. that. You tripping? I bet you. Didn't get, I bet you didn't get in that Off water. Of though. Hell, nah, I ain't getting in no water. You know, <laughs> hey, now nah, hell no. Nah. Uh -huh. I ain't. I can't swim. Can you doggy pedal? If Kevin Hart said that's not how you say it. Okay. <laughs> but that's what you do. Yeah. Uh, Dream while in our show, head to head episode. With you watching as a fan, Ooh. who would who would be on the show? You two. Oh, okay. Ooh. <laughs> All the smoke, dude. We Let's might need do that. We Let's might need do that. that together. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do that. I think that'll be fire. That would be dope. Uh, one album you can listen to on repeat, no skips. Ooh. Uh, probably Life After Death, mm. uh, Big Smoke. Mm. You a sun up, sun down type of guy. So what do you do at sun up and what do you do at sundown? Oh, uh, yeah. Sun up or I'm up before the sun, but that's meditating until mm -hmm. the sun come up. You know what I mean? Watching it, that, that, taking that time. Uh, sun down, putting them kids to bed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like Showers, it, yeah, brush your that, teeth, know that eat, process. get your ass yeah. to bed. Yeah. Soon as the sun go mm -hmm. down. Oh, it's bedtime. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, five dinner guests, dead or alive? Ooh, Tupac, Martin Luther King. Uh, mm, dang, Dick Gregory. Mm. Uh, Marvin Gaye and Bob Marley. Ooh, mm. that's a session. It's <laughs> a real session. Ah, yes, indeed. Before you ask this last question, I feel like Nick is the kind of dude that's really going to help now, us. No, do this, this. Like, this is the. I'm, a, I'm so happy to ask him this question. Yeah, because I feel I like mean, he's going to really help us do it. It might be beneficial. Yeah. We asked a whole bunch of people this question. They just heard it and walked out. They didn't even pay attention to it. <laughs> right? <laughs> a lot of people come I'm on the show. The pressure now. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you could see anyone on the show, who, could it, who would it be? But. But. You have to help us get your answer on the show. You see how we gassed you before oh. we asked you? Back. You see how we gassed you Gash before you. we asked you? <laughs> Rage! Dang, I'm trying to think. Y'all done had, like... We had them all. You had Denzel yet? No. Nope. You and Will Smith Will said, said that. Let's, let's get it. So we're going to have to get press it. both y'all to get let's Denzel. Let's get it. Let's get it. Yeah. Denzel? Denzel. Ooh. Oh shit, we gotta make that happen. I'm putting cases on all you motherfuckers. Cause he just he wanted he a walking just walking wisdom, man. Like mm. he, aside from all the great performances and acting and who he is as a humanitarian, like his wit he especially cause he an OG now too. So he ready to give you the game and talk like he just got everything he say is mm. quotable. That was mm. T.I. said. T.I. Mm -hmm. said he calmed him down. T.I. said he was walking around like a little ant on set, just nervous, and then they're like, hey, sit down, <laughs> sit down, let's talk to you. They got you here for a reason. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you, you can tell he's that OG. Yeah, mm. man. Well, we need would, to get him on the show, this. dog. Yeah. yeah. Yo, make the call. Like, yeah. Whatever we got to do. Let's get it. <laughs> got some merch. Oh. They got this stuff in the Louis bag or something. It's <laughs> like the regular on the smoke bag, is it? You want me to uh, do what I do? Sure, go ahead. Hey, our people out there in this world, <laughs> we have a nice little care package for our brother Nick Cannon, and we have in here, oh, this is some new shit. We ain't got this. The Manscaped Body Wash. <laughs> okay. We ain't get this one. We got okay. the buffer and all that. And the... What else they got in there? Uh, no, this is my tree. <laughs> dropped in this bag. <laughs> How'd that end up in there? I don't know. <laughs> Got some all the smoke gear though, bro. And all where can they, where could they get the all the smoke gear so they can look as fresh as they can? All the smoke got store. Well, appreciate Nick, you man. being here, bro. We appreciate man. it. Can't, leave, can't let you leave empty-handed. We just want to say, man, for you. I mean, when, when we asked you early on, like who you looked up to in the space and kind of modeled, like you're that you're that person now. You know, uh -huh. you're you're that person now, and 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 we want to make sure we give you your flowers, man, because. The hats you wear and, and the grind you put yourself through and, and, and you're transparent, you're vulnerable, 
you win, you lose, but you keep fighting, man. And we just want to say, man, we appreciate what you do for the culture. Man, that's 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 that means a lot coming from y'all, for man, because sure. you guys are doing everything that you just said, man. Like it's it's real. You guys are pillars and examples, you know, to so many. Because, I mean, you went in in so many different fields and, and accomplished your dreams at, at the highest level and then still can remain humble and, and relatable. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's y'all are a modern day giants in, in most people's eyes when you see, like, you know, from being superstar athletes and then even the platforms like this, man. You, I don't know if you guys understand the impact that, like, young black boys see when they see you, you know what I mean, and see what you've done and even continue on careers mm -hmm. and continue to elevate, man. So I, I commend you and salute you in a big way. We appreciate thank, you, thank bro. you, bro. And yeah. you know, we, we both, you doing things that we both trying to do. You know, he want to be behind the camera. I want to be in front. So yeah. just make sure we can get in contact with you so we can pick, <laughs> so we can pick your brain and, you know, cause we, it's a lot of stuff that we don't yeah. know about the things that we getting into. Yeah, yeah. So You've been this book, your man. whole life. So right. we can pick your brain and get some advice. I'm here. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate deck, it. Whenever. Appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap, man. All the smoke. Nick Cannon, you can catch us on Showtime Basketball YouTube and the iHeart platform, Black Effects. Get it. We'll see y'all next week. Let's get it. Daniel Gallagher, convicted of murder in the second degree. And we understand you do have a statement you've prepared. My position, my accomplishments. Next to that, she meant nothing. I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. I did not kill that woman, and I'm going to prove it. Fatal Attraction, now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Use promo code FATALATTRACTION for one month free.